allow uh, what was happening to them to distract me from what I thought or could see needed to be done. There is a tendency for ministers uh, to expect deference from the uh, lobbyists who come to ask uh, favours or benefits from government. I've got to say that there was never any sign of deference in my meetings with the AIDS groups. A bit of rat-baggery was exactly what Blewett had been looking for. Gay activists and government began a new partnership. Gays would devise their own AIDS prevention strategy. Abstinence doesn't work because uh, it doesn't work for gay men in, any more than it, it works for, 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 for the rest of the community. People have a right to have sex. They want to have sex. We tossed around in the early days, can we um, sell mutual masturbation at a sat as a satisfactory, satisfying sex life? And we rapidly worked out we could not because we couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't sell it to ourselves, let alone try to persuade a community to do it. To the sex workers, the answer had been obvious. But for so many gay men, it remained unfathomable. It goes against the natural dynamics of male sex. And really, no matter what anybody says, no matter you know, how safe it is, it is the most boring practice in sexual history, having to put a condom on. There is no way in the world that you can make that fun. That was the challenge, to make condoms sexy. A dangerous proposition, given the times. I want to know what have these people been doing to get the virus? It's very repulsive. Homosexual relation. Very repulsive. While some Australians zeroed in on anal sex as public enemy number one, the gay community celebrated it. What we were actually trying to do was change values. What constitutes a, a good gay man? That's where you start. What, what would um, you know, an 80s up to the minute gay man do? He would use a condom. Funding for these campaigns came from the very top. If you were really to get at the gay community, you had to use language, uh, material, uh, which would be very difficult to put the government's imprimatur on. So it was very useful to have groups whom we could fund, but who would have the responsibility for actual, actually preparing the material. Our job politically was to run interference, to make sure that we gave them space and time to allow these policies to work. All the evidence that I've seen is that we will cope with it best by governments having a cooperative relationship in this matter with the gay community. That doesn't mean doing everything that the gays want governments to do. Governments have to make their own decisions. I don't remember seeing any material before it went out. I did see quite a bit of the material. Sometimes it alarmed me after it had been distributed. To be perfectly candid, we told a huge professional fib when we suggested that condoms could protect you against HIV. Uh, fortunately, we were right, but we had absolutely no evidence on which to base that claim. Sometimes you just got to wing it on common sense and reasonable inductions from other experiences. On the streets, the sex workers weren't taking a backward step either. They're booted off the street as soon as anyone finds out that, you know, they're working without condoms. And number two, if a guy's stupid enough to go with a girl without a condom, he deserves everything he gets. You know? hey, These people that are going around, you know, having you casual too. sex in pubs and clubs, you know, picking up girls, you know, just, oh, yeah, have a few drinks, let's go home and have a root. You know, they're the ones that are spreading AIDS, not the workers, because the workers are using condoms, you know? The sex workers started organising themselves very early on. Then our job wasn't to... Uh, make their life any harder. Our job was to give them money and support and encouragement to keep on going and educating sex workers and clients about the problem. With funding from the state and the Commonwealth, the Australian Prostitutes Collective made history. It's the first time in the world, as far as uh, I know, that uh, a government had uh, seen fit to fund a bunch of whores, really, and their friends. They took the money and went straight back to the doors that had been locked to them, the illegal brothels. 
we needed to get one of the big, big, big brothels in town to, to come on board with us. So we approached the Nevada. And I knew as well as uh, he did and uh, every other brothel in town that business was at an all-time low. And um, so I, I went to see Gordon to say, you know, perhaps there are ways that we can turn this around. We'll arrange for publicity and promote the Nevada like uh, it's never been promoted before. Now Gordon had to ask himself what was worse, bankruptcy or a year in the nick. The ancient instincts of an illicit industry, of course, won out. We invited the Sydney Morning Herald to come and we uh, spent a whole day in there doing big photo shoots and interviews and, uh, and Gordon bravely announced that, that the Nevada from here on in was a safe sex house and there'd be no negotiation entered into. Business at the Nevada boomed. Clients were issued with this written guarantee. As some men may feel they're losing some sensation by using a condom, we wish to point out that our ladies are very experienced in matters of your sensitivity and will ensure that the utmost care will be taken for your ultimate satisfaction. But up the road, Alex Wodak was getting nowhere. I wrote submission after submission and, and sometimes I got replies back from the health department saying that I couldn't start a pilot program because my submission was too short or too long or asked for too little money or too much money or was too academic or not academic enough. And then I decided that I was being played around with. Wodak and his colleagues were about to become criminals. The penalty for supplying needles to inject drugs was two years prison. We put a note on the door that day, free needles and syringes, press the buzzer. He was called into the state health department and ordered to stop. Nothing was going to stop me anyway because I knew I was right. Days later, the vice squad brought him in for questioning. And I was really pumped up, ready for this, and I had all the facts and figures at my fingertips and I could tell them what HIV prevalence was in Milan and Geneva and New York and New Jersey and wherever and um, I could give them the whole argument which was very strong. With a nod and a wink from the police the needle exchange kept going. Soon the idea was being discussed openly all over Australia. I remember Dr Blewett being interviewed on television around about that time and the interviewer asked him uh, whether he supported needle and syringe programs. And he gave a fantastic answer. I strongly support the needle exchange programs. We decided that it was a lesser evil to uh, ensure that there were clean needles uh, rather than that there was AIDS. And we're not pretending, and I don't think any of us would say, well, it's something we welcome doing, but we've got to make judgments in terms of public health. And as soon as he said that, I knew we'd won. Across the country, Hundreds of people were now busy handing out needles. An invisible legion of users needed to be reached. Not just in the cross, but where most drug users live. In the suburbs. Only experts could find them. I had some experience of how people usually look when they're waiting to score. Uh, you know, I have some experience of noticing who's dealing in a, in a street or whatever. And he would take a, a swag backpack of condoms and syringes. They didn't particularly like you driving up in a van with, you know, you know, needle and syringe exchange plastered all over it. So, you know, you had to find ways around these things. You had to find ways of getting to these people. With street pragmatism, Alan Winchester took the quickest way to the users, through the dealers. It made it much easier to drop off, you know, 200 needles at one place and it did to go around to 200 different places. By now, while stories of plague ran daily in the papers, government was funding gay men to run explicit erotic campaigns about anal sex, sex workers to reform practices within illegal brothels, and the supply of clean needles for injectors.